say this morning, but every morning we worship you. We come to church on Sunday mornings and Wednesday for some of us, and and to be, to be fair, it becomes part of a ritual, it becomes part of a tradition, we get used to it. Yes, it's a human thing, we get used to these things, and God just becomes an everyday occurrence. So I'm one of those, we, we do it because... Where is your heart this morning? As we worship the Lord this morning, we're, the next song we're going to sing is, How Great Thou Art. My God is great. He's not just here. He's not just working in our lives. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything that goes with it, down to our atoms. Where is your heart this morning? Is it focused on God? Because a lot of the Sundays, I'm going to be honest with you, it becomes a droning. It just becomes... Everyday thing. So where's our heart this morning? How great thou art, Lord. You are good, Lord God. We worship you this morning because you created us out of love. You didn't have to, but you did. Lord God, so we stand in awe of the son you created. Not the, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. Lord God, we are saved because of our faith in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. How great thou art. Consider all the world. 
Father, Lord God, help us come back to the heart of worship where we make it all about you. Lord God, you you have become known. You are our victory, Lord God. On our own, we can't do it. So in another another way we can that we can worship you, Lord God, through song, through the reading of your word, through through acts of kindness, through, through loving people, is another, Lord God, that we don't ever consider. We, that we have a hard, hard time considering is tithing, giving back, Lord God. Giving back to the orphans and the widows and those that are in dire need of, of your help from the church and help from just daily needs, Lord God. And so we ask that you would just prick our hearts a little bit this morning. Help us use this time of singing song and worship and this time of tithing back, Lord God, a little bit.
a way to worship you. It feels good to give back. God, guide us. You are our victory through our lives, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our freedom wasn't free, that it came at a cost. And some of these words and phrases have, as Kendall was saying earlier, become so common in our usage that we forget that you really did bleed and die on that cross. 
And not only that, but you orchestrated the whole event and promised it from days of old that there would be a seed of a woman who would come and crush the head of the serpent. But not without injury and not without suffering. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for the blood and for the suffering and the pain that you endured for our sakes. Only that you didn't have to do it. Your love bled for us. And so help us, um, Father, to be properly motivated <laughs> to change the way we live and to live in light of the sacrifice of the fact that we're blood-bought saints and, yes, beloved children, but the scriptures also use this, the word slave. We've been bought with a price. We're obligated <laughs> to serve you because of your love. And, and you show us, you teach us um, to love to love you back, which is not something we naturally do. So God, would you give us that belief, give us that faith, and, and fill us with that love. Help us to really get it deep down in who we really are. Would you be with us over the next few minutes, and as we open your word, would you give us ears to hear, and would you change our hearts this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, before, I, uh, before we open the Word and preach a little bit, uh, we have uh, something exciting that we get to do this morning that we don't get to do very often, and that is uh, a, few, a few months ago, uh, well, actually last month, we kind of brought you, the congregation, up to date on our, uh, the work that's been going on behind the scenes to ordain a new lay elder of our church, and somebody uh, new to join our elder team uh, his name's Craig Tromborg, and um, so the, the last stage of that process is to bring him before you guys, and we did that a couple of months ago, or that last month, to say, Craig is pursuing this, and if anybody um, is aware of any reason why Craig shouldn't be an elder at our church to come forward, and we knew that that was very, uh, very likely not going to happen. Uh, Craig is a guy of uh, great character, and he's been uh, part of our church family for a while, and, and um, those of you who know him know his love for the Lord and um, and that he's qualified for eldership. And so we're here at the final stage of that, which is uh, what the Bible calls laying hands on an elder. And so I'm going to ask that Craig and his wife Lynn come forward, and also any of the elders who I've already invited to come forward. We're going to have a couple of them pray in a few moments. But as they come forward, I just want to read a passage that is a good reminder about what eldership is and what an elder, uh, what, what, what this is all about. This is something we get from Scripture. We didn't come up with this idea as our local body, right? This is straight from Scripture. This is Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says to Titus, he says, This is why I left you in Crete, um, so that you might uh, put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he goes on, he says, If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination... For an overseer or elder, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold fast to the, uh, to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And so from the beginning of Scripture, we learn that um, a protection and a grace that God gives His people is multiplicity in leadership. Um, since the very beginning, uh, when Moses led his people out into to the, to the wilderness, um, Jethro showed up, his father-in-law, and said, Hey, Mo, why are you trying to do everything to lead all of these thousands of people? This is not good for them, and it's not good for you. So go find... Some, some able men who won't take a bribe, who love justice, and appoint them as, as chiefs of the thousands and hundreds, fifties and tens, right? So this principle is all throughout Scripture, that um, there's no CEO of the church, right? 
that there's to be a, 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 a accountability for pastoral leadership uh, within the body of, uh, of, a, of a board of elders or a, a team of elders, whatever term you want to throw out there. And so on top of that, he gives very specific qualifications that I just read, that an elder must be a man of, a man of God and, and have, show a certain level of discipline and character in his life. And so, and, and, and so this is something that was handed down to us by the apostles, right? And, and it, but, it, but they didn't come up with it either. The Holy Spirit has been leading God's people to organize themselves in this way for thousands of years. And so we're excited to be able to be at this moment with Craig and with uh, his wife Lynn and, and their involvement at our church for Craig to enter into the office of eldership. And I'm going to ask him to give a... He's, he's got a, a quick thing he wanted to share and then... Um, and then Virgil and Kirk are going to pray, and we're going to lay hands in a minute. Um, just wanted to uh, share with you, you know, we've been coming to this church now for about three years and, and really felt uh, blessed by uh, the sound teaching, um, the fellowship and the spirit that we've enjoyed, and then um, getting to know and be fitted together and joining with you guys in, in service. And and so that's been a it's been a real blessing for us, um, and um, I'm really looking forward to, with with joy to uh, be being on the uh, elder board with the other elders to uh, assist this body and each of you in um, in growing in in your walk with Christ and your walk with each other mm-hmm. and finding um, God's and finding and fulfilling God's. Uh, purpose and calling for your life. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Here, Virgil, I'll give that to you first. But what we're going to do, um, you know, the Bible talks about laying hands on elders, and that's a very uh, palpable and, and physical thing, um, and it's part of like we're, we're uh, spiritual beings, but we have a body, right? And there's sort of something to the connect, like the physical connection, right? And so what we want to do is something we've never done before in this particular uh, prayer ceremony, which is invite you guys to be a part of it. We're going to, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna, in a minute, I'll invite Craig and Lynn to stand here, and we'll, we'll surround them and lay our hands on him, but, them on, uh, but we're going to ask that you guys, if you would, stand up and kind of fill the aisles and just put your hand on the person, the shoulder of the person in front of you, right? We did this a couple of weeks ago. It was actually not my idea. It was Tom and Nudie. Akio, who led us through a little prayer service for my parents and my brothers before they went off to the Philippines. If you were there that night, that was a, a cool moment. But it's just a, a way f- uh, for us to show unity that this isn't just the elders. This is our whole congregation coming together and, and as, as together priests uh, in the body of Christ coming together and, and, and recognizing this moment, which is an exciting and, and joyful occasion. So I'm going to ask Craig and Lynn if you guys would stand forward and you guys can stand up and come, come join us. I'll, when when everybody's all gathered, I'll let Virgil start. <laughs> Father, I thank you that you are in our midst, that you are in our presence. I thank you, Father, for um, a man and his wife who they live to give glory to you. I thank you, Father, for a man who has taken the call to be an overseer and to live that life, that life of integrity and of pure and devoted worship before you. And so, Father, right now, um, I pray, Father, that he would be diligent to present himself as um, a, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, as your scripture teaches, rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, knowing that the enemy... Um, does not like when uh, someone comes in uh, to oversee a wonderful congregation like ours. I pray that you would put protection over his family. I pray that you would put protection over his household. Father, I pray that he would grow in every fruit of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that he would discern. I pray, Father, that he would bring fruit to our congregation. Lord, I pray that he would bring fruit and just an important part of every decision that is made here. Lord, I pray, Father, would you use him for your glory? And Father, I pray that the result would be that 
our campus at Neighborhood Church, Lord, I pray that we would only grow, and Lord, I pray that we would only become stronger because of what Craig is gonna bring to us. Bless him, Father, this, play, this day. Bless him, keep him. Let your face, Father, I pray, shine upon him in Jesus' name. I do, Father, thank, <clears throat> thank you for this brother and for bringing him and his wife here to this uh, body of believers here. I thank you, Lord, that you're the head of the body. You're, and, Lord, I thank you for the leadership here. I thank you for uh, all the members here. And, Lord, we all play a part in the body of Christ. Help us to always remember that no one's more important than another person. Lord, we're all important in this to, to further your kingdom. So, Lord, again, I do pray for uh, Craig and thank you for him and for his testimony, just talking to him over the years and uh, just uh, uh, having Bible studies together with him and uh, in every way. And so, Lord, I too pray for you to watch over him, keep him strong in you and in your word, and uh, just guide and direct him uh, throughout this community as well. And that uh, in, a, in his neighborhood and among friends and neighbors and relatives, Lord, just uh, help him, him and them to be the, the witness that you have them to be here where you've placed us. Help us all to be the witness here in Sebring that you placed us to be uh, here to glorify your name and to lift up your name. So. Lord, again, I thank you for our pastors here, the body that meets here, and just help us to encourage one another. Help us not to tear anyone down, but just encourage one another as we just see the day approaching. And we thank you for all you do for us, and we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So this is, uh, this is Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1. I just want to read it. It's funny, you know, we have a lot of extra things going on this morning, and, and so I have a shorter amount of time to preach than I normally do. I'm going to try and do my best with it. I have a super easy passage this morning, so that's a joke, as you're about to see. Now, judge not that you not be judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. How, do you, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give the dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So in case you thought that the first part was easy, then we'll throw in the part about pearls before pigs. Figure out what that's about, right? What in the world is Jesus talking about here? Well, the first part's not hard to understand. The first part's just hard to put into practice. But then he throws in a little bit of hard to understand on top of it. But it's God's word, and he has something for us. What is it? I think that there is a that this is that our ears perk up when we hear this, especially verse one, because we're we're a culture that's having a conversation about judgment. Um, it, it is a it's a common uh, thread of conversation and of of just a theme about judgment. In fact, there's people who have never read the Bible, right? Who don't care about religion, they don't care about the church, but they know. Judge not lest ye be judged, from the old King James. And they'll quote it right back to you. So what's going on here? We live in this world. I think, I, I think, I'll give you my key principle, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the cultural things. I think what Jesus is saying that ties everything in this passage together is this. When we judge others, it says more about us than the, the one we are accusing. That the attitude of condemnation and of judgment is actually more about us than it is about all of those sinners out there, right? We tend to think the problem is out there. It's the agenda, right? It's the political party. It's the neighbors that are, you know, doing, doing, dealing drugs. or I, I don't know. Like, it's always on the other side of the street, you know what I mean, where the problem is. It's those people over there. But what Jesus is saying is actually if everybody just had the attitude that I was the judge, Jesus <laughs> was the judge, 
and they worried themselves mostly about their own hearts, <laughs> we'd live in a much better place. Some might call that the kingdom of God, right? Where he alone is the judge, and we're only concerned about our relationship with him. That's what a little taste of what the kingdom is going to be. When we judge somebody, when we condemn others, when we gossip about people, when we armchair quarterback the next person in the pew about their life, their marriage, their kids, whatever, right? It says something about us more than it says something about them. We live in a time where people believe that nothing is wrong. There's no such thing as right and wrong. Or if there is right and wrong, nobody's smart enough to define it for everybody else, so we all walk around with our own definitions of right and wrong. Right? Well, that's true for you, but it might not be true for me. It's this whole idea of uh, relativity, right? Moral, re- re- the, everything moral, everything truth is relative. And what's funny is, even though we live in a world where nobody is, everybody thinks that nothing is wrong, everybody's afraid of being judged. The worst thing that you could do to a person is judge them. And isn't that ironic? (laughs) See, because if there really is no such thing as right or wrong, then what's judgment? Judgment's just somebody's opinion, right? But what the fear of judgment means is it reveals something deep that we know as humans, by default, that there is such a thing as right and wrong. And I don't like it when people tell me that I'm wrong. Am I the only one? Okay. It's just your wrong opinion. And I have a right opinion, and this, is, this is, and this is how we get into the mess that we are as a society, right? This is how we get into the stuff that you see on cable news and on social media, the partisan bickering, the pointing of fingers, the identity stuff, right? And, and it's not just about the, the sexuality identity stuff. It's, it's people have created a version of being human that is the right way to be human. And if you come against that, you're attacking me. And so I join all of my little people against your little people, and we have battle, right? And we used to do this as nations and countries, and now more than ever, what we do it, how we do it is through ideologies, right? And it's... What I'm not saying is that there's no such thing as a right or wrong ideology. Clearly, the scriptures is what defines a right and a wrong ideology. I'm just helping us to see that when Jesus comes in and starts talking about judgment, we've got to be careful to not do what our culture does, which is take one verse and throw it at people and says, you can't tell me I'm wrong. Because that's what people do with chapter chapter 7, verse 1, right? It just means there's no such thing as truth. Well, you've got to read the rest of the book to find out that, no, there really is a judge. And the problem is, you aren't him. <laughs> and neither am I. And, and we live in a world of people who want to be on the throne. And we're all there. We all start there. And we have to submit and release that desire and that goal of being in charge And that's one of the first things. So I want to look at three things related to judgment. The first thing is the danger of judging. The second thing is the, um, what is the second one? The the hypocrisy of judging. And then the third one is the folly of judging. Here's the first one, the danger in judging. What's so dangerous about judging? Jesus says, judge not that not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That's a scary two verses, isn't it? See, because here's the thing. God didn't make robots. He made people who can make choices. And God won't make you obey him. He gives you the choice. And so he said it a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, months ago now, we were in that section that talks about beware of practicing your righteousness before others that they may see your good works, right? And praise you. And, and what was fascinating about that passage is that he, he doesn't say, if you do your righteousness in order to be seen by others, then you're going to go to hell. He didn't say that. 
He didn't bring condemnation. What he said was there's a natural consequence. If you want to be praised by others and you do your righteousness for your prayer, your giving, your, your fasting in order to be seen by others, then you can have that as your reward. God will let you have the thing you most want. Right? God let the Israelites have the thing that they wanted. He let them have Baal and Ashtaroth, right? But he warned them, and he said, this is what's going to happen if you go that direction. He does the same with judging. He says, judge not, because here's the thing. If you judge, you'll be judged by that same measure. You can have the role, but understand that I ultimately will judge, and I will judge by the same standard that you judged other people. Wow. If that doesn't scare us a little bit, like there's a proper amount of fear and trembling that comes with that, right? Because who, who in this room, don't, don't raise your hand if you think you've never judged somebody. Okay, good. Because if you raised your hand, we'd all judge you. And, and then we'd be in deeper trouble. But this is sobering, right? With the measure that you measure other people, I'll measure it against you. So there's a danger to it. And, and, and this is the thing. We all have the choice to make. And he'll let us have our sin. But not, without, not before warning us, right? And saying this is the severity that you're walking into. It's not judge not because sin's not really a big deal. It's judge not because you're not the judge. We have all these phrases in our culture, right? That judgment is... Um, I'm talking about like uh, this 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 value we have of not judging others of, of like it's we can have my I can have my convictions but like my opinions about that stop at my nose and whatever happens out there people are free to do whatever right it's like judge this is a judgment free zone right that's one phrase that we have to talk about that and and this comes from this twisted idea that what Jesus is talking about here is that we have no right to distinguish good from evil. Is that what Jesus is saying? No, we know it from other scripture. We're going to look at one in a second. Where, where, where Paul, one of the apostles of the early church, literally says that he's condemned a man. So it's not that we can't choose, we can't determine what's good or bad. We can't know right from wrong. In fact, in our culture, the only thing that everybody agrees is wrong is to judge somebody. That's the thing we all can agree on in, in this broken system that you know, secular, the secular world has created apart from God. But the, the Bible is pretty clear that we have to be wise and discerning judges, that God has actually given us a capacity to know right from wrong. It's a conscience that he's put in all of us. Some of us is more seared than others, but like we all know there's a judge and we all know that there's a right right from a wrong. And that it, especially when it comes to the body of believers, we actually have a command from Scripture to, to, to call out sin when we see it. Because that's love, right? Because sin isn't just fun stuff that God decided one day we weren't allowed to do. Sin is a spiritual cancer that will kill you. Right? It's, it leads... The, 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 the wages of sin is... Death. So if somebody you love is headed in a way towards destruction, what, what, are you, what do you have to do as a dad, as a mom, as a friend? You have to intervene. You have to say something. We have an example of this in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul hears a rumor that there's a guy in the church in Corinth who's doing all kinds of crazy sexual sin. It says that it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. You ought, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And the 21st century reading of Matthew chapter 7, we would say, Wow, Paul, that's pretty judgy. What right do you have to say that this guy has to be removed from the church, Right? It says, for though absent in the body, I am present with you in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment 
on the one who did such a thing. So Paul's saying, I've already judged them. As an apostle, somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, I have a right, even a responsibility to judge this person. Has Paul gone rogue? Has he not read Matthew chapter 7, verse 1? No. He just understands that what, what Jesus wasn't talking about was calling out sin. That's not judgment in Jesus' understanding. What Jesus is talking about is condemnation. When we give up on a person and write them off, by the way, condemnation might look like not saying anything to that person about their sin. Sitting back and watching the whole thing burn to the ground. And sadly, it happens in churches every single day. We know somebody that we need to have that conversation with. And rather than talking to them about it, we talk to other people about it. Or we just think to ourselves, man, I wish that they would see the light. And in our own little way, we have condemned, right, and judged that person. Instead of doing what we're commanded to do, which is call out sin, not out of a heart of condemnation like I'm the judge, but hey, I know who the judge is. And, and I know what he said. He has said that this, is gonna, this will end in your destruction, brother or sister. And so that's why Paul is so seemingly crazy about it, right? He comes off and he says, listen, this, you can't permit this to happen. You have to move now to dismiss this person from your midst. And he's not being judgy. He's being loving. He says, he says in verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, and then he has to clarify, because they clearly missed the point. He says, not at all meaning the people of this world, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. He said, you guys, if you, if you wanted to not associate with any sinners, you'd have to be like the Amish. You'd have to move into a, onto a you know, piece of land somewhere and not have any friends except for your little church family, and that's not what I'm calling you to do at all. He says, but I am writing to you now not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality. And it would be really great for all of us if he had just stopped there because we could say, well, if I don't have sexual sin in my life, then I'm fine. But he had to continue. He had to continue and say things like greed. Wow. Or is an idolater, somebody who has elevated something in their life above their commitment to God. Or a reviler, or drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. Wow. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Why do we feel like it's our job to point out all the sin in a secular culture? Meanwhile, we've got a log hanging out the eye of the church every single day. Why? He says, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? <laughs> God judge, judges those outside. And then he quotes the Old Testament. He says, purge the evil person from among you. And he goes on. Honestly, chapters 5 and 6 of 1 Corinthians are a perfect little uh, side commentary on what Jesus is talking about here. And if you, if you have time later and you feel like a homework assignment, just go read it and mark it up. Because he talks about judgment and judging a bunch of different times. And it's sort of fascinating to see how, how, how to compare Jesus' one-liner teaching with how Paul uh, c commanded a, 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 a local body to put that principle of judgment and condemnation into action. But what's going on here, right? We have to judge we have to know what's right versus wrong because it's been told to us in the Word. What we aren't supposed to do is act as the human version of God, bring down condemnation on brothers and sisters. There's only one judge whose approval ultimately matters, right? There's only one um, judge whose verdict means anything. And there's only one judge who gets off of the bench and comes down and pays the penalty for the accused, who was rightly accused, who, was, who has been tried and found guilty, every single one of us, right? 
And he came down off the bench and he paid the penalty for us. Aren't you glad that we have him as a judge and not me? Because <laughs> if it was up to you and to me to judge, we'd all be in hell. Right? We would have condemned ourselves right into oblivion, right into eternal separation from God. But he's the only righteous judge. And not only does he have a right judgment, but he has love and compassion and grace. And it's not that he wrote off the sin. It's that he poured out the wrath that was due for the sin on the Son. Wow. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then he continues. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you will, be, you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. One of the reasons why we would all make lousy judges is because we have bad perception. Do you see the irony of the way it's worded? You can see the speck. You can see the tiniest little problem, right? In everybody else. It's like sports TV, right? They all sit back. Guys who can't play football, or at least anymore. And they judge what a guy did. A split-second choice that a finely tuned athlete made, right? under immense amount of pressure, millions of people watching. Well, if he just would have put his foot an inch to the right, it would have been a complete pass, right? We can see the, the potential bad motives of our spouse. We can see a lack of discipline in our kids, right? We can see all kinds of little problems that other people are having. Meanwhile, we've got a plank hanging out of our See the irony there. This is, if you've read this a bunch of times, you miss the joke because you're just like, oh yeah, this is the speck and log one. You know, it's like hearing a knock knock joke you've heard too many times, right? But when you read this and you read it with fresh eyes and think, okay, I've never read this before, it's funny, right? It's like Looney Tunes ca cartoon. And it's, it's Jesus using something humorous, a, 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 a observational comedy, right? to talk about something very serious. So, because just imagine this, right? Have you ever had an eyelash in your eye? Of course we all have. Right? You have something in your eye? How, how it becomes the number one priority of your day, right? To get that out of your eye. You can't drive, you can't focus, you can't do anything with the tiniest little bit of something in your eye. We'll go to the, you know, we'll go to the, go to the sink and try and rinse it out and bend over backwards trying to get it out, have our spouse come over and try and get it, right? Why? Because it hurts. And what a, like, what a beautiful illustration for sin, right? It's, it's, it, is a, it's, it hurts. It is nagging, right? Um, I, I, got, I got hit in the... Uh, when I, I went, I went one, one year, my youth group, when I was a kid, did a middle school um, winter retreat at the church camp that we attended, and it was super snowy. There was a lot of sledding and snowball fights and stuff. It was a lot of fun. It's a miracle we didn't all end up in the hospital. I almost did. Um, I, was in a, I was walking across the, the uh, open field, and people were chucking snowballs left and right, and I got just out of nowhere. I didn't see it coming. I got hit with a snowball. Right in this eye. And I'm, I'm lucky that it didn't like seriously like separate something in there because it was, it was bad. It was some of the worst pain I've ever been in in my whole life. You know, for about an hour. You, you ever get something like that? Like you, you can't, like you can't bring yourself to open that eye. Right, like your body's in defense mode trying to protect it. You can't ignore that kind of pain. Right. So what Jesus is saying is, it's like somebody who's been impaled through their eye. 
with a log. <laughs> the Greek word is like a, it's like a plank, like a board. What's fascinating is Jesus was a carpenter, right? So he had worked with wood before. He knew what it was like to be working with wood and to get a splinter or to get something in your eye. And, and so he says, he says, it's like you've got a log in your eye and you, you don't even notice it. And what a, what a beautiful illustration for what it looks like to live in unconfessed sin, right? To be walking around, hide, like, like ignoring immense amount of pain, ignoring the fact that like your daily stuff, you can't even, I mean, if you had, uh, go back in Looney Tunes land and imagine, right, somebody with a log out their eye, which I understand it's physically impossible, but Jesus is, is being hyperbolic to make a point. So you've got a log out of your eye. Like, what things can you not do if you've got a log come out your eye, right? Like, not to mention the, the amount of pain. Like, you can't drive, you can't do anything. It's, it's like, you know, flailing around with you. And, and, and he says, you can't do anything. He says, but you have this incredible ability. We have this incredible ability to, to cover up right? To, to learn to just get, uh, kind of just survive through the pain. It's okay. I, I can make it with this log. He says, just take the log out. Just how about instead of being worried about everybody else's little problems, you deal with your problem. And what's fascinating is, right, it's, it's the word for this being translated speck is uh, often, it's a piece of wood, okay? So the, there's, a, there's a special, there's something going on here where he's saying, we like to think, oh, that person is an extra big sinner because their sin is one of the big ones that's on the news, right? Meanwhile, my sin is not really a big deal. My greed is not really as big of a deal as somebody who's practicing homosexuality, right? And what Jesus says is, actually, it's all made of the same material. It all came from the same place. So how about you take the log out? And like wounded animals, what we often do is we run and hide. And we, and we do that to the pain of our family, to the pain of everybody around us, especially the people that we like to try and do unwilling eye surgery to. Right? Because imagine, imagine going into the optometrist to get eye surgery and the guy has an eye patch on, not to mention a log hanging out of his eye. Right? Imagine somebody offering to get something out your eye, but you notice they're walking with a cane, right? I don't want anybody like that. Like, they're they're a blind person. I don't want that person anywhere near my eye. And that's what Jesus is saying. You can't fix other people's stuff when you've got a log hanging out of your eye. So what's the log? What's your log? What's your plank? Why don't we take it out? Because it's going to hurt, right? It's like the old West movies. The guy gets shot with an arrow. He knows it's got to come out, right? But he keeps it in there maybe a little too long because he knows it's going to hurt coming out almost as bad as it did going in. It's easier just to live with it, right? Can I tell you it's not? And Jesus gives us an out. He doesn't notice he doesn't come down and say, all you people with logs, you're going to hell. It's all over for you. (laughs) He says, take the log out. Get rid of it. Whatever it is. The addiction, right? The the bitterness, the greed, the pride. Pull it out. It's going to hurt for a minute. But guess what? After that, maybe after some time, you'll be able to see clearly. And you'll actually be able to fulfill your purpose as a person, which is to help other people see clearly. A blind man, as Jesus says this in six, uh, Luke 6, 39, can a blind man lead the blind? Won't they both wind up in a pit? If that doesn't like, speak to our culture, I don't know what does, right? But Jesus says, I, I, I've provided a way, I've given you my truth. I want you to be able to see and see clearly, not just for your good, but for the sake of your brother who's got a splinter in his eye, which, by the way, if you have a splinter in your eye, you've got problems, Right? I'd like somebody to help come get the splinter out of my eye. But we can't do it, right? We can't do it if we've got our, our logs in. When Jesus gets a hold of our lives, he shows us that we must first undergo transformation before we can help others experience 
transformation. It's so easy to get focused on other people's problems. But here's this. Maybe the best way to help your spouse grow closer to God is not to call out their sin, but to confess your own. Maybe the most effective evangelism strategy is believers who are actually living out a life of obedience to Jesus before we go talk to them about homosexuality or about sexual sin or any number of the other hot-button topics you guys want to talk about, right? It's not that those things are okay. It's that we've got to deal with ourselves, right? What's the log in your eye? What needs to be removed from your life before you can go on to Jesus' purpose to help rescue others from the suffering of sin? Because that's the, that's the thing I take away from this illustration. Because those of us who've ever had unconfessed sin in our life know it hurts. But we learn to ignore the hurt to our own destruction, right? We are supposed to be done. But we have one last section. Jesus says this. He says, don't give to dogs what is holy and don't throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. You know, I've heard this taught before or heard people debating about the meaning of this. This is a weird, this is a weird one. And I'm only about 40% sure I know what Jesus is even talking about here. So I feel a little bit, it's maybe a good reason it's right at the end of the sermon. <laughs> But if you go and you read some people's commentaries, everybody's got question, more questions than answers about what Jesus is talking about here. And that's sometimes good. Jesus talked in a lot of difficult and hard-to-understand sayings. I think he does it because he likes us to come and ask him. Right? He likes the, the heart of the disciples who come later and say, hey, can you explain that parable? Because I don't get it. <laughs> and I think sometimes he gives us some, some, some help with that. But what, uh, what often I've heard people say is, what this is saying is there's some people who are just never going to get the gospel. So it's not, so like don't waste your witness on them. And I have a hard time with that interpretation because it seems to go against everything Jesus got done saying about judging and condemnation, right? So it's probably not that. I, I do think that if you zoom out, we, we tend to associate dogs and pigs with like uh, Gentiles in the scriptures because... Gentiles ate pigs, and pigs were unclean to the Jewish people, right? But Jesus didn't tend to hang on to the Jewish people's racism issues with Gentiles as much as they thought that he would, because he said, I actually came to seek and to save the whole world. <laughs> and so I don't think it's talking about Gentiles, or else we're all pigs in the scenario, <laughs> most of us anyway. Uh, I think what he's saying is this. There's some times where we think we have an answer for somebody that they're not ready to get. I think we have a truth that Jesus gave us, and we think it's going to fix everybody else's problems, but they're just trying to figure out like, how to survive, right? That's what dogs and pigs do. Dogs, don't give what, to hold, what is holy to dogs is just common sense, right? Because dogs will destroy everything in sight, at least my dog does. Right? It's, you know, we put these animals in, a, in our houses, and then we're surprised when they chew our furniture, right? Like, this is just what they do, it's just their nature, and it's not bad, they're just dogs. And pigs are the same way. Pigs have no pockets, right? Pigs, pigs not really necklace wearers, not big into jewelry. Um, they have no use for your pearls, and they're just going to walk on them because that's what pigs do. And I think one of the subtle ways that we judge people, one of the subtle ways we actually elevate and pride our own thoughts and our own stuff over people who are in trouble is when we Bible bomb people with problems, right? We just give them John 3.16. We just give them Philippians whatever, you know. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Tell that to the parent who's struggling. And the parent who's struggling just wants to, like, slap you, right? Because what I needed is a hug, and I'll be there for you. And I got, maybe I know that, but... So I don't, I don't really know. I'm still struggling with this section, but I think a lot of times what happens is we have something we know is valuable, but the other person doesn't get it yet. And, and so what we do is we chuck pearls. And we're not helping us because we're out of pearl. And we're not helping them because they can't do anything with it. And so it's a subtle way that we judge when we, when we do that. We've, we've somewhere along the line thought that, began to think that the way, our job as disciple makers is to win arguments when our job is to win people. And so I think that's a little bit of what Jesus is saying in the folly of the whole pearls and holy things before dogs and pigs. Would you pray with me? 
God, we humbly come before you knowing that it's only by your spirit that we can begin to understand what you're, what you're saying in your word. Um, and we thank you for illuminating, for pointing out even this morning the sin, the plank, the log that's hanging out our eye. Would you help us, Lord, to give the courage to pull it out? That we'd confess our sin to a spouse, confess our sin to a Bible study mate, uh, somebody we, we can trust to confess it to you, uh, to, to just say it out loud. And that in that moment, the healing begins. And it's not that everything's going to be perfect and we're never going to get back to that spot again, but we just commit to this life of confessing and, and, and not being so focused on everybody else's little problems and nitpicking their lives and playing Monday morning quarterback for our family or our friends or our neighbors, our lost neighbors especially, but that we would just spend that time being honest about ourselves before you. And, and you promise, Lord, to illuminate our hearts if we come with a, a broken and a contrite heart, that you're going to make us new and, and that you're going to be healing and that we'll actually be able to be more effective in loving the people around us if we're healthy, if we've confessed our sin, if you are doing a work in our hearts first. Thank you for your patience with us hypocrites because we all have been there or are there. And thank you for giving us a way forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When peace like a river
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, prepare us, Lord God. Lord, help us this week to, to look forward to Sunday for next Sunday, Lord God, but not to make it an or not to make it a normal Sunday, but make it a Sunday where we are refreshed, where we remind ourselves, where we know that you're coming again. So we need to be singing loud for your return. Bring us back safely next Sunday, Lord God. And for the youth this, this Sunday, this evening, Lord God, bring us back safely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's good to see you guys. Don't forget about church tonight for the youth. Youth at six. Thank you, Clinton. Youth at six. Thanks. Battle buddy. Battle buddy right there. That's true. Great things.